let's talk about some of these trials you guys have or that you guys are directly involved with. What do you guys want to start? I'll let you all peg. You can start. since we were talking about Alzheimer's. Yeah, we let's can do it. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. What do you got? What's going on, podcast world? This is Mike Corvino with Core Console RX. I am joined by my little cousin, Rachel Corvino, and also her um, boss, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Emily, how are y'all doing today? Good, how are you? Doing very, great. very good. Thanks for doing this today. I, I appreciate y'all coming on the show. Um, Cole can't be here today, so he's the guy that normally is the co-host. He's my co-host with me. Um, him and his wife bought a house, so wow. they're in the process of moving and doing all that fun family stuff, so... Um, just, you're stuck with just me today, but, uh, <laughs> well, good for him. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, um, basically, uh, I want to give, you know, you guys a chance to talk about your, you know, backgrounds briefly, and then we'll talk about what, uh, some research you guys have okay. going on at Palmetto Primary Care. Um, so Rachel, what's your background? <laughs> My background? So I will, um, be, have been a registered nurse for three years next month. I'm a RN BSN and I started off my career on an ortho neuro floor um, and then moved into research and it's been awesome. Emily? Hi, my name's Emily. No, just kidding. Um, I have a BS in biology. I did pre-med in college um, and ended up figuring out I didn't, didn't want to go to med school. <laughs> so I uh, worked in a doctor's office for a couple of years, fell into research about 15 years ago and have been doing it ever since. That's awesome. And, and Rachel, um, most people that have their, their BSNs are usually like, you know, 23, 24, 25. How old are you? 21. <laughs> and you've been a nurse for three years. Yep. Cool. So I'll let you guys do the math on that one. So she's, <laughs> she's the smart one in the family. And so, uh, you know, she's, it's, we're, we're proud of her for sure. Um, but this is the first time her and I have actually gotten to do anything like medically related together. So this is cool. Um, so you said research. So, um, y'all work with Palmetto Primary Care, which is a, uh, for those of you who don't know, you're not local. Um, that's like a, a very large, um, physicians group in the Charleston, Somerville area. And they have multiple specialties that they deal with now, like GI. Um, they have their own like urgent care place. They have, um, you know, diagnostics and all kinds of things. So, um, it's a it's a good group. It's actually the physician's office that I see personally. So um, I've I've known with you guys for a while. I actually did a rotation with Palmetto Primary Care when I was in pharmacy school. Oh really? Um, there was a, a pharmacist that was on staff. Um, he's no longer there, but he was doing the diabetes education and things like that. And so I did a month with him, uh, took call on patients and things like that. So. Cool. And you guys have a couple pharmacists now, right? That yeah. Are on, on on different areas. I think. They yeah. mostly do the diabetes education. Yeah, um, they are, both work on quality, so they work mm-hmm. with not only diabetic education, but they also educate um, other people on their medicines in general and whether they need to be changed or not, and that different different kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, very cool. Yeah. Um, have you guys? Do have you guys interacting? Do you guys interact like with the with them at all, or with the PAs and MDs directly, or how does that work for you guys? Yeah, so we have several different. I guess, types of interactions. Um, What Rachel does is um, speak with them about the patients she finds that potentially qualify for the studies um, and messages them and talks to them about whether they think these are appropriate patients for the studies. Um, And then on my side, we are actually starting to do uh, registry studies with the PharmDs and actually the quality committee that we have at Palmetto Primary Care Physicians. Very cool. Um, so what kind of led you guys into to research? So, cause you guys are actually doing like, when we think of research, you know, obviously there's like the, the bench work, the lab work types of things. And then there's also like the, the further progression, you know, which is where you guys are at the actual clinical trials, phase two, phase three, like dealing with actual patients and people where it's a lot more of uh, on the line if something goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how, how did you guys kind of come into that? Did you just sort of just kind of evolve with your careers or do you kind of always know research would be an option? Um, it sort of involved with my career. Um, like I said, when I got out of college, I wasn't real sure what I was going to do. Um, and I had a neurologist that took a chance on me, started, uh, and the only thing they told me about clinical research is that it was a lot of paperwork, (laughs) (laughs) which it is. Um, so that's sort of how my life in research evolved. Um, I started it not knowing whether I'd like it or not, because research is one of those things that you either love it or you hate it. Um, and it turns out that I loved it. Um, it 
for me, it involves everything um, that has to do with my personality. Um, so I'm a little OCD, so it helps with that. I like dealing with people and patients, so um, it obviously encompasses that as well. Um, and I like to be you know, ahead of the curve in front of the game. And that's exactly what research is, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're at the forefront of medicine. You see all the new stuff that's coming out. Even if you're not involved in that study, you can, you know, you're always aware of what's around the bend. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, I for really sure. Like well, you, Rachel? I kind of fell into it, um, you know, in the same way I was working in the hospital and it wasn't really for me. Um, and I just happened to meet who is kind of our president. Right. Yep. Dr. Grossman. <laughs> um, and he, I met him out. We just got to talking about it and it really was, sounded interesting to me. And they, again, took a chance on me and um, it ended up being something that I really liked. I loved the attention to detail that you have to have. And like Emily said, being a, at the forefront of everything and you get to learn about so many different uh, specialties. In our office alone, we have three endocrinologists we're work four endocrinologists we're working with, a neurologist, two internal medicine physicians, and OBGYN. So it's really interesting. And I think we're gonna start working with a GI. GI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different play uh specialties. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So how does it work? I mean kinda of walk me through the process because, you know, I'm I'm always on the side of taking the research that you guys have done and then applying it after it's been published to patient care. And so, and I, I, I love the whole keeping up with the most current and, and up to date data. That's one of my, you know, big pushes for my entire career is, is that. So I like that you've kind of brought that up that, um, you know, getting to see the stuff before it's even published, but, um, walk me through like, you know, yes, definitely a lot of paperwork and things like that, but going through like the inclusion exclusion criteria, stuff like that, how, how does that process work for y'all? Um, well, since you, you want to start, because you're going to be Sure. <laughs> um, uh, when, so we can uh, run queries? Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, we can uh, run queries in our patient database, and I go through those. Uh, we can look up specific um, ICD-10 codes or lab results. Um, so I will get the uh, inclusion-exclusion and kind of go through those uh look at patients that I think might be appropriate candidates. Of course, like we said, talk to their doctor, um, make sure that it would be something that would benefit them. And then I talk to the patient, uh, kind of introduce them to the study, why we're doing it, um, what the benefits and uh, the risks are, and um, kind of get the ball rolling. And then uh, they come in for um, screening and to enroll in the trial after that. Yeah. And there, I mean, you mentioned inclusion, exclusion criteria, and that is kind of a big deal. That's the main part of Rachel's job um, is, you know, some of these studies, there's as few as two inclusion and like three exclusion criteria. And then we have a couple of studies where it's 20 to 30 each. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, they, are, they do look for very specific patients in a lot of these trials. So that's one of the things with Rachel's attention to detail she's very good at is finding that sort of needle in the haystack. Um, of, with patients so that's pretty cool and how about uh, the provider like uh, if kind of I guess do, do they seem to jump on board with a lot of these trials is there any pushback to where like no I don't want my patients to be involved in this how does that relationship go for uh, the most part for the most part um, I would say 99% of physicians PAs you know uh, are uh, excited about it um, it's, it, it's like we said, it puts them at the forefront of medicine and anybody in medicine, I think is a little bit competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise they couldn't do what they're doing. Um, so it definitely helps them, um, gain knowledge that they wouldn't normally gain any other way, um, because this stuff isn't published yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're usually excited about learning, um, and everyone's always excited about helping their patients. Um, uh, for example, one of the Alzheimer's trials we have is a completely new, um, drug that is potentially that they're testing now it's in phase two. Um, and this is something that our neurologist is able to offer their patients, um, that they, have either failed previous therapy or um, maybe this is just something new they want to try on on these guys so that it's nice for them too yeah that's awesome especially in a, in a case especially with like alzheimer's things like that i mean you're talking we have currently two drugs that have you know what i would argue is very very borderline efficacy <laughs> and so having more on the horizon is very encouraging to a lot of families and stuff especially when they have loved ones dealing with that mm -hmm. um 
So, you know, let's talk about some of these trials you guys have or that you guys are directly involved with. What do you guys want to start? I'll let you off peg. You can start. Since we were talking about Alzheimer's, yeah, we let's can do talk it. about that. Yeah. Sounds good. What do you got? Do you want to find it? Hmm? Do you want to talk about it? Sure, I can uh, okay. start talking. <laughs> um, so we are doing a study. It's a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study um, that is evaluating the efficacy and safety of a uh, new drug called an uh, AR1001 in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And um, this medication is actually pretty interesting because it's a PDE5 inhibitor. Hmm. Um, so they're looking at uh, the uh, ability of it and the efficacy of it um, to help clear the uh, neuritic plaques and the um, neurofibrillary tangles and the inflammation in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's a really interesting um medication you know for that disease process so uh, that one's been a very interesting one to watch the patients in it because we've a lot of the patients that we have in it right now are actually pretty close to the end um yeah they're about to roll over um they're they've done an extension study Mm -hmm. with that so yeah yeah that's cool and so um are these patients that have you know, already undergone like treatment with the Nipazel, um, momentanine, and, and they failed, or are they like, like, are they using this on top of their current treatments? Do you know? They're using it on top of it. Um, the only thing in this one, they just have to be on a stable dose, mm-hmm. um, for a period of time. Um, and then this is just like an added, uh, medication to that. Cool. And um, the I was looking through some of the because all these are on clinicaltrials.gov, so I'll, I'll put some of the links in the show notes. But uh, I was looking through some like the primary outcomes, and uh, it looks like they're using the ADAS COG thirteen is one of the pro- primary, um, and then some of the secondary. They're using a lot of the different uh, like questionnaires and like geriatric depression scale, um, and uh, mini mental status exam things like that. So um, you know that's that's definitely cool. I think one of the this is something that I always kind of run into, especially with the current treatments we have available. I think and the best way I've heard this explained is because, you know, like Denepazil, for instance, has such limited, you know, statistically it can, it meets significance, but from a clinical significance standpoint, that's where, you know, okay, if we can add, um, you know, certain points back to the mini mental status exam, is that something that is truly clinically impactful? And I've heard sometimes, you know, where, you don't really see too much like actual improvement that a lot of times you're treating the family almost um, <laughs> because like the family just wants to feel like they're doing something. Yeah. And I've, I've run into that tip, you know, with my patients too, it's where it's, you know, the family's like, well, we, we got to do something. And so, you know, I think that it's going to be interesting to see, and this is still, you know, obviously a few years out, but it'd be interesting to see how much, because if we could get like a big improvement on some of those, those scores, some of those questionnaires like that, then it would be huge compared to what we have now. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. An interesting thing kind of off that point is that in this study, they actually have to have a family member or someone who lives with them, takes care of them, caregiver, who can go to all the visits with them and kind of give a second opinion of how they're doing, you know, and keeping track of whether they're taking their medication and things like that. So it kind of helps them to be involved and to feel like that they're helping their family member, their loved one in the best way that they can. Yeah, That's true. Uh, and to add on to that, the caregivers actually are interviewed um, mm-hmm. during the visits as well throughout the study. Um, and there, um, there's a the second the sub eye is a secondary neurologist who is blinded to the actual scales, the um, patient's scales. Um, but he interviews the caregiver throughout the study and to see the changes that the caregiver sees. So that's also kind of cool, mm-hmm. I think, in this study. And you mentioned it's a uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. So <laughs> does that mean that, uh, you know, people taking, like, Viagra and stuff, they're going to be, who knows, maybe we've been curing their Alzheimer's, we didn't even know about it? <laughs> <laughs> maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> I did, guess we'll find out. Did, um, th- have you, have they mentioned it all? And I haven't even, I haven't gone back and looked at some of, like, the phase 1, phase 2, where they've, you know, done some of the initial, you know, biochem mm-hmm. studies on it and whatnot. But um, have you, do you, have you read anything as far as, like, this why this particular agent is you know being studied or is there anything special about its chemical structure that differs from like you know sildenafil or tadafinil or one of those oh uh, one of the other pdfrs yeah um, is, it, like, is there anything special about this one like why this one if they're looking at it as opposed to um uh, the 
I think the reason this drug um, is because this company developed it. Mm-hmm. Um, so Viagra is obviously already out, mm-hmm. um, as, a, as is the rest of them. So I think this, this company was a small Korean company mm-hmm. um, that recently came to the United States um, and developed this drug. I, I don't think it was originally meant if I remember correctly, because the vice president actually came and talked to us. And uh, I believe it wasn't originally meant for this, but it was sort of, as all drugs is, this was a strange side effects that happened. Hmm. Um, so they took it and kind of ran with it. Hmm. Um, it kind of like the same reason Viagra had a strange side effect and it became what it did. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So I think, uh, it was approved in South Korea for that uh, indication. For, erect, it, for yeah, erectile yeah, dysfunction? Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. That'll be really interesting, too, to see if, obviously, they won't have the indication because they're not doing the study, or mm-hmm. maybe they are doing the studies. I don't know. But, um, you know, have seen the other, um, you know, agents that are using erectile dysfunction to see if they jump on the bandwagon. If they, they get positive results, I would imagine yeah. to see that they're going to be like, oh, we also have a drug that can, <laughs> exactly. that can help and improves quality of life and <laughs> <laughs> decreases Alzheimer's symptoms. <laughs> That's true. So, um, um, what else? Anything else on that one, Rachel? That we want you want to mention, or um, what? Or what else you got going? On? What's what else is in the pipeline? Let's see. Uh, another. I think we could talk about the uh, Rapatha study that we're doing. Sure. Right We've yeah. done. If you want to talk to the history of Rapatha with our. Um, How many? Yeah, well, Rapatha is one of our, which is with Amgen. Mm -hmm. Um, We've done a couple studies with them, but we actually did all of the anti-PSK9s for Sanofi and Regeneron and um, actually Pfizer before they they actually had one of them. They shut down the program. Yeah, shut down. So the... Even in the beginning of these trials, when we were doing, you know, the Sanofis, um, it was amazing the outcome, as as you've seen, um, cause the data is published, um, about the lowering of, of all these drugs. I mean, it, it got to the point that in some of the later studies, cause we've done about 14 or 15 of them, um, in the later studies, they were actually doing, um, PK samplings and some bio, um, I just lost the word, biochemical <laughs> samplings, um, because they were afraid that patients' LDLs were going too low. Mm-hmm. And nobody's ever tested how low is too up low mm-hmm. for LDL. So that's kind of part of the data that they're gathering now, too, with some of this. Yeah, I have uh, one of my old professors who I still consider like a mentor and whatnot. He's, he, one of the questions he'll always ask is because th- that for a long time, you know, with, with the old, you know, Framingham risk reduction scores and stuff like that with the older guidelines, they would say, you know, less than 100. Now we've kind of gone back to the LDL. You know, we got off that for a little bit. Now we're back to it again as of this year. So, um, you know, but one of the concerns that I've heard students and things bring up is like, well, what if the LDL is 70 and we bring it lower? You know, what then? And he would always say, well, what's too low for your LDL? And and people would, because there is no answer. And he says, mine's, he would always joke, mine's 16. He goes, (laughs) goes, and I feel great. (laughs) And so that's a good answer. Yeah. And so he he actually would use his own, uh, his own labs to uh, talk about that. But that's, interesting and because I, I would be willing to bet we're not really going to see too much problem because like with um foyer that looked at repath i mean we had ldls very low um and so I'd, I'd be surprised if there's any actual issues with bringing it down too low um but it'd be interesting to see especially because this is the first time it's really been studied in patients that have not had like a true like event right like mm-hmm. so no cva no mi yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. um so what are, you, what are your thoughts about like how they set it up this time? Because this is kind of like the next step in the evolution of PCSK9 inhibitors. Yeah, I think That's it's a- really cool um, looking at to see if this could actually help. Uh, per, per, I lost the word. Um, <laughs> lower the risk of, you know, those events. And and um, so and it's just such an effective drug already. I mean, looking at this population, you could possibly prevent, you know, MIs and CVAs. That's awesome. <laughs> So uh, I think one of the one of the concerns I think that most like practitioners will bring up about PCSK nines is really just the cost. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And both companies, Sanofi and um, um, what's the other one, um, the Repath, um, uh, Amgen. Um, Amgen. Thank you. Yeah. It totally <laughs> went blank for a second. <laughs> um, both of them have reduced their price quite a bit, but it's just, it is still expensive, it's still expensive drug. Expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, has there been any talk at all? Um, you know, w- if you guys heard any, you know, whispers as far as them really trying to like get competitive with the pricing. Um, that's no, we're not supposed to have that information, but of course we do. Cause we work at a doctor's office. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I don't 
think that they're actively trying to get competitive. Um, I know they have a lot of the patient assistance programs that they work very hard on. Um, and when, when the drugs first came out, you know, it was very hard to get patients on there. They had to have an actual event or, you know, be at high risk. Um, and I think they've kind of freed some of that up Mm -hmm. a little bit. So their patient assistance programs have gotten better. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know if I've heard anything about actual lowering of costs because that would be great. Yeah. Um, the drug is just, it's hard to make. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And it's, yeah, I mean, and I get it. Like, I mean, the, the amount of money it costs to put on the mm-hmm. studies and things. And yeah, I think yeah. that's going to be, I'm interested to see, cause the, the newest lipid guidelines came out before the price drops. And so they had a whole section in their guidelines that talked about like, you know, the quality adjusted life years versus the cost and like kind of a cost benefit analysis and showed like where the mm-hmm. price would need to be decreased in order for it to truly be considered like, a cost, cost, a cost benefit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's, I, I'm curious to see if they kind of like update that before the, like the true new guidelines come out, mm-hmm. if they kind of just add that in as far as, uh, you know, getting their thoughts and seeing if they're a little bit more likely to yeah. recommend those versus, cause now, I mean, they definitely will recommend them, but it's like, you have to be on high intensity stat and you have to have these certain risk factors. You have mm-hmm. to have tried as at a mob and then they say like, try the PCSK9 inhibitor. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see if like, as the price continues to go down, if they kind of revamp that a little bit. Yeah. 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 I've had a lot of providers um, that I've approached uh, for their patients to be candidates in the, for the study. Mm-hmm. And they've been really excited. Um, a lot of them like that. This is a drug that they wouldn't, the patient would not otherwise be able to afford. And now they could possibly, you know, if they qualify, get it for, uh, at no cost for five years. I mean, they're really excited about that, which is something cool about clinical trials is like, it's another service almost that you can offer patients, especially in Palmetto primary care. Um, they've already got so many specialties and now you, you know, you've got this whole other uh, service that we offer of new uh, frontline medications and devices and things like that. At no cost to patients. At no cost to patients, yeah. yep. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing that, um, just in case anybody's looking at these clinical trials, one thing I thought was um, could potentially throw you off a little bit, but I do want to kind of point out is that they mentioned that one of the inclusion criteria is the patient has to have significant coronary artery disease, you know, CAD, mm-hmm. um, and but they cannot have had a stroke or MI. And so just kind of like as a reminder, you know, when we talk about CAD, we're talking about like the overarching term, um, you know, this overarching umbrella that kind of covers like our, you know, stable ischemic heart disease or angina, things like that, as well as the the true like emergency. So, you know, unstable angina, um, STEMI, non-STEMI, um, the actual like acute coronary syndrome versus, you know, so when we say an MI, you know, stroke, they can't have had a uh, cabbage, um, things like that. So this is these are healthier patients that were involved in the previous studies. Um, so, well, they, they do have to have had either CAD or um, peripheral arterial disease, diabetes, things like that, but um, no MI or no stroke. And so that's what we're really going to be focusing on is seeing CV death, um, instance of MI, instance of stroke, and seeing if that can decrease those at all. Right. So. Well, that's some of the endpoints in the study. So, yeah. It'd be, it'd be good to see. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that one. I have, I have to, I was trying to look through here real quick to see when the expected uh, study end is, I'm assuming like, um, I think, I think this one is in that event driven 2024 or something yeah, would be I the expected. So. They're, they're, they're looking for a, a big population in the study. Um, 13,000 participants. Mm-hmm. So it might take them a while to get that. Yeah. The estimated study completion date is about 2024. Nailed it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. Um, so, um, yeah, that'll be interesting to see because, mm-hmm. and then have, have, Rachel, have you looked at all about with the new guidelines? Did you notice at that at all? Um, before when you were doing direct patient care before you kind of switched over, um, um or have you read through the new lipid guidelines at all? I'm a, uh, I'm slacking. I haven't. Uh, that's all right. there, there's <laughs> how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Rachel. You're supposed to be a good little nerd. I know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad they are including diabetes patients as well. Cause that was a whole separate you know, sort of algorithm mm-hmm. in the new lipid guidelines was patients with diabetes and, uh, you know, whether they're looking at primary prevention, secondary prevention, and they separated it out with patients that had, you know, just, uh, diabetes patients. So that was, that was good. Um, and the other thing that I think this is important. So for the people who get caught up on the price, I will say, you know, yes, it's super expensive. It's hard to get, you know, if, especially if a patient doesn't have insurance, of course, it's probably not gonna be an option for them. But, um, you know, what, 
our alternatives right now. We have statins and we have azetamide, which azetamide even is is a little bit sketchy. We're basing our outcome data on you know one study where it was combined with simvastatin and mm-hmm. the improve it study. So uh, you know that one's kind of like we're extrapolating that data to all statins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they had combined it with a torvastatin, you know high intensity torvastatin, that would be maybe not as uh, efficacious. Um, but then besides that, I mean, Vesipa now has data mm-hmm. that shows yeah. outcome, which is great. Um, but other than that, I mean, f- you know, the fibrates, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Jim Fibrazol, f- um, phenofiber, all those, mm-hmm. no outcome data. I mean, they can lower triglycerides, but there's no good outcome data. So we lower the triglycerides and they have an MI. So great. Awesome. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> they just have an MI with better triglycerides. Um, <laughs> niacin's complete trash. You know, there, there's things like that. And so like, it's just, you know, I'm glad they're at least looking at this because, you know, what are our alternatives at this point? We're, yeah. We don't have a ton of medications. If you have someone that's already on a statin, um, you know, we're yeah, limited on what lot. we can add. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it'd be good. I'm curious to see how it kind of turns out, especially uh, since we already have the four-year, the Odyssey outcomes with um, Prolulent. Mm-hmm. You know, we kind of, mm-hmm. we know that it can decrease, you know, especially secondary prevention. So mm-hmm. getting yeah. some kind of primary prevention, some high-risk patients would be cool to see. That's been the, the huge push the last few years. Yes. is that cardiovascular outcomes, all oh, the diabetes yeah. medications Everybody have to go has, through it. So, yeah. Well, the FDA kind of, you know, yeah. put that out for, for almost everybody. Um, mm-hmm. We're actually doing a cardiovascular um, study, huge um, cardiovascular outside, outcome study um, with testosterone replacement. Mm-hmm. That'll be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that's the huge question now. <laughs> Whereas, yeah. you know, it, and we see it, right, with, with people like – that are using it for performance enhancement. You get these young, like otherwise athletic they, guys that look on the outside like physical specimens, and then they're yeah. they're having events, you know, very early. Yeah. And it's like, huh. I wonder what's going on. <laughs> and, and, and and I get the mechanism behind it, you know, where mm-hmm. it can increase the atherosclerosis, things like that. Mm-hmm. But now the question is, is it is it because they're taking such high doses, or is it because that's just what testosterone does, mm-hmm. which is you know um, would not be great for all the older you know men or even yeah. guys in their forties that are on testosterone replacement therapy uh, that's being monitored by a physician mm-hmm. if it's still right. putting them under risk for or at risk for having a uh, event yeah. early. Mm-hmm. It's like oof. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see. That's yeah. what they're looking at in this study. I think the patient age group is like 45 to 80 mm-hmm. and so they're looking at that specific population to see hmm, yeah is there a link here mm-hmm. have y'all seen uh clomid being used for instead of like actual testosterone replacement there's this drug called clomid which right. is a uh, fertility medication that we used to use back in the day for um to you know increased fertility and whatnot and couples trying to have a baby and we realized that um when we give it to males <laughs> Um, you know, cause it increases your luteinizing hormone, your focal stimulating hormone and which in a female is great right. in a male, your body's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and it just starts freaking out. And then actually it basically like increases your endogenous testosterone to just ramp up production. Cause it's like, no, 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 no. We're, we're trying to do our male thing. And oh, it starts, wow. it actually starts mm-hmm. trying to suppress those by shooting up your testosterone levels. So oh. there's some urologists and, um, whatnot that are using, uh, that in men instead of testosterone and actually getting some pretty good results with it. Um, um, cause it wouldn't, it wouldn't in theory have the same, cause you're not adding exogenous testosterone, um, but you're just kind of replenishing your natural, uh, levels with your natural testosterone. So it's kind of interesting there, but, um, yeah, I think testosterone therapy for a lot of guys is awesome. It, it changes people's lives, but yeah. we got to know that for sure. Yeah. And there's a whole generation yeah. of guys that we may have put at a lot of risk for events yeah. yeah you know and the, yeah that's what we're about to find out hopefully hopefully not yeah ho- <laughs> hopefully not that's yeah. like uh all the aspirin stuff that comes out we've been doing something for 30 years now all of a sudden yeah. we're like oh whoops yeah. <laughs> sorry about sorry about that <laughs> we're really we didn't know it's crazy it's like oh never mind yeah, yeah. Nope, stop. <laughs> i mean i feel like that's all medicine but yeah. it's you know we used to what bleed people and yep. yeah. all kinds so we have to wash our hands like what are you talking about we can't use the same tools on everybody yeah <laughs> i was reading a uh, a book um talking about like uh old you know medicine and things like that and they were talking about how some of those surgeons back in the day they were no like they would just kind of like get almost like notoriety if they could do a surgery very quickly and then move on to the next patient. So you do like, just kind of like wipe off the, the knife and then Ooh, keep, keep on going. going. And oh, because they could do it so quick because there's no anesthetic to like numb the pain. So they would just do it as quick as they could to try to get the process over. Uh, so that was like their clan fan zero regard to like, they had no idea what microbiology was. <laughs> they, it's just, it's crazy to really? see how far we've come in a couple wow. hundred years. I know. But so what else you got, Rachel? 
Sorry, my mic was cutting out. Unbelievable. Um, my headphones. <laughs> um, uh, another one that I thought would be interesting to talk about, um, we have an endometriosis study uh, looking at women with um, endometriosis-related pain, at least five out of a um, zero to ten scale. And they're looking at a... I'm going to make sure I say it right. Um, Good luck. Uh, P2X3 uh, in... Um, Receptor inhibitor, probably just butchered P2X3 that. P2X3 receptor antagonist. Antagonist, sorry. There it is. <laughs> I knew I, was, I would butcher it. Jeff um, Pixent. Jeff Pixent. Oh, look, yep. he did it. Yay. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, well, the, well the, po- the pill pusher to pronounce, <laughs> pronounce the drugs. Pronounce them properly, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this one's really interesting. It's a phase two um, study to evaluate the efficacy and safety and tolerability of, um, how do you pronounce it again? Which one? Oh, the Jeff. drug itself. Yeah. Um, it's uh, Jevapixent. Jevapixent. <laughs> there we go. Um, in premenopausal female uh, patients with moderate to severe endometriosis related pain. Um, and so they're doing a placebo control uh, on that. And they're comparing it with, uh, they're, all patients are getting access to as needed naproxen, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the red, uh, rescue medication. Um, they can't take in this study uh, any other kind of treatment for it besides the. Um, jif- the drug, the, <laughs> the study drug, drug. the there study drug, and um, and I the, like the the, uh, and the MK seventy two uh, was it seventy two sixty four? Yes, uh, yeah. Yep. Merck always has their MK. Yeah, <laughs> they do like their MK. <laughs> they love it. Yeah. MK everything, all day. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what about like, uh, and I haven't looked at the, I, I'm just trying to pull it up real quick to look at the inclusion, exclusion criteria, but um, are, what about like estrogen, progesterone, contraception? Are they st- uh, stopping all yeah, that? Yeah, they have to stop. Okay. Yeah. Or, yeah. All hormone therapy. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Um, and the, the, the cool thing about this is obviously it's non-hormonal, mm-hmm. um, which is part of the reason they want to stop the hormone therapy and make sure it, this is what's um, being effective versus something else. Um, but that's really why I like the study and like the drug. Um, the inclusion exclusion is very similar to other endometriosis um, trials. Um, you have to be diagnosed. Um, and for uh, especially recent trials, you have to be diagnosed within the last 10 years, um, surgically diagnosed. So they have to have a lap, mm-hmm. um, which can be difficult. In, in some ways. Yep. Um, but it, it the drug itself and the study itself is just really cool because it's one of the first non-hormonal mm-hmm. um, medications we've had for endometriosis. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's 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 why I really like this study. Yeah, yeah. because, I mean, the other option, I mean, besides you know, we have, like, our gonadotropin-releasing hormones, we mm-hmm. have the, um, like, aromatase inhibitors. Um, but, yeah, this would be cool if we can get, like, a another a completely new class mm-hmm. of medication especially if they show that you know adding it to kind of as needed naproxen is effective mm-hmm. yeah um that'll be interesting mm-hmm. i saw that they're actually looking at this for a chronic unexplained cough as yeah. well <laughs> yep. so that, um, that's interesting yeah i read that um because it's actually in the investigator brochure and i can't remember it has something to do with the inhibitor part of, mm-hmm. or the antagonist <laughs> part of, of it um and it's that and there's also was it a rheumatoid arthritis pain some other pain as well yeah because yeah. I, uh, I was reading through some an older study um that was looking at more like the biochem uh, behind it. And it looks like they were saying that it has, um, when, when you get that um, P2X2, three receptor antagonism, that it, it has, it decreases like the um, afferent, the sensory afferent neurons um, mm-hmm. firing, I guess. And, and so it, it works as like a ATP gated channel, um, I guess, in those types of those afferent neurons. And um, they were saying that it has similar efficacy to like things like gabapentin and whatnot for like mm-hmm. neuropathic pain. So this this could be like a big drug class that we might be seeing. Yeah, you know, yeah. It has a lot of different things they're looking at it for. And it'd be interesting to see uh, the chronic cough ones kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I would assume there's just a lot of those um, receptors present in the lungs, but mm-hmm. um, maybe it'd be something that for patients who have a like a, a chronic cough with like an ACE inhibitor and oh, you know yeah, yeah, and yeah. maybe I mean obviously we can just switch them to an ARB and it'd be a little bit easier but <laughs> who knows maybe this will be something that can <laughs> they can take that and stop or the, the, or I'd be curious to see even if they can target those once we know this receptor works or something like that maybe they'll make new ACE inhibitors that also block those oh, and they'll get rid of yeah. the cough I don't yeah. know who That's knows a good idea. Yeah. I, a combo it's, drug. it's probably not a good idea but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's going to block bradykinin and all that that actually causes the cough, but we'll see. That's just me thinking out loud. <laughs> um, but yeah, that'll be interesting to see. Um, and you guys are looking at another uh, GLP-1 too, right, in diabetes patients? 
Yes, yeah. that one's been delayed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, what happened? It's a uh, it's Pfizer is the one doing it. It's, okay. a, it's actually delayed. Due Poor to Pfizer. They just keep. I know. <laughs> they lost their Prevnar recommendations. They lost <laughs> <laughs> their GLP one, their PCSK nine. Yeah, this one, it rough. This one's just put on hold. Um, they uh for drug production. Mm. They, um, they really have to kind of have all the drug up and going and ready to go before they start studies. And they were actually going to start three different studies at one time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they just didn't have enough drug. It's supposed yeah. to be coming first quarter next year, first or second I quarter think so. first, next yeah. year. Um, so yeah, but it, it should be cool um, because it's way more specific, if I remember correctly. The criteria? Yeah. No. Well, the drug itself. Oh. Um, um, I'm trying to. Remember. It's been a while yeah. since we looked at that one because uh, yeah. it got delayed. Um, I just remember the. Uh, was it oral? Or was it injectable? It was oral. Yeah. It was oral because yeah. mm-hmm. that's gonna be the next big thing. Is now that uh, the semaglutide from mm-hmm. Novo has their oral version yeah. coming out this year, um, it's gonna be crazy to see. Like everybody's gonna try to jump on that bandwagon. I think. Yeah. Well, we did that study. Did you? Yeah. The okay. Nova, we've been on All several the, the Nova pioneer studies. studies. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and it's. Just to give insider insider information, it's very cool. Works yeah. very well. It's I, amazing. GOP ones are by f- absolute far my favorite class of besides metformin, my favorite class <laughs> of drugs for patients with diet with type two yeah. diabetes. Mm-hmm. And actually, even I'm really curious to see in type ones as well. Um, did that study too? Did actually. you? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, not so good actually. <laughs> so the, what's curious though is I've actually I've actually had um, in one of my students even is a type one diabetic mm-hmm. and was on it put herself on. Uh, um, a GLP-1 one. and actually had her A1C better controlled more so than it has been her whole life. And I think it's going to be hard from a clinical trial standpoint because, you know, it, it, it's going to be really patient specific. But right. um, mm-hmm. and for those of you who are like super confused as to why you would use that in a type one, um, if you think about mechanistically, obviously they have to continue taking insulin, whereas a type two, a lot of times this is the first injectable we would use is a GLP-1 instead of basal or, or prandial insulin. Um, but in a type one, because they're not able to produce insulin and we're giving exogenous insulin, which immediately is going to ramp up production of glucagon. And so when you give a GLP-1, you also are suppressing glucagon production from alpha cells. And so in, in, in theory, you know, you would be suppressing that glucagon, allowing the insulin to stick around longer. You're shutting down gluconeogenesis, glucogenolysis, um, and allowing the you know, the insulin they're injecting to actually work more effectively. Now, that hasn't played out too well in clinical studies at this point, so they haven't been able to get the indication for it. But I do know that um, there are several endocrinologists that are looking at yeah. it and yeah. trying it off label, which is very cool. I think it's I and I. I liked the concept when we were presented with the study with type ones, um, was really cool. I think, um, just from my personal experience with the, the study we did, um, it really has to do with the, with the patient. Um, if they are quote unquote, a good type one diabetic, so they, um, are, you know, do their basal bolus or they're on a pump, they control their insulin. Well, they know their highs and lows, um, putting that kind of person on GLP one is good. Um, some of our patients, um, I think maybe we're more real world maybe. Um, so for them to bolus, um, kind of shot them up and down, Mm -hmm. you add a GLP one to that, you know, high or low, um, it, it drops them really quick. Um, so that, that's, I think, um, what they found overall. I know that's kind of what we had happen at our site. Um, Mm -hmm. it just dropped them too low. Um, but if you have a good, you know, steady patient that knows their body and mm-hmm. knows how they work, um, and you add that, I think it's terrific. Yeah. You know, the concept is excellent. Yeah, I like it too. For I mean, a type one that also needs help with like weight loss because we have it approved. We have liraglutide or Sexenda um, uh, appl- approved for weight loss in patients without diabetes, and so. Um, you know, the having that option as, you know, someone who has type one that may, especially like you said, is controlled, like they're able to, you know, use their pump correctly or at least calculate their insulin need throughout the day appropriately. And then being able to give them this on topics. I know like my student, she was very open about it. So this is why I know it. she's okay with me sharing this. Um, <laughs> she did her pro presentation. She came in the podcast and talked about it already, oh, but, cool. um, she did uh, her grand rounds like as are the big to get your farm to you have to give your big you know research topic at the end of your four years and um, she did hers on basically her patient was herself which was, oh. which was very <laughs> very cool and um, so she said she ended up losing I think she said like forty pounds on oh, it oh wow um, yeah and so yeah it, it was for her it was a very very good option I think it's gonna be a yeah. very patient specific thing but mm-hmm. yeah. I'm curious to see how it goes 
We did um, another Novo study. It was still injectable. It's the weekly injectable mm-hmm. for type twos the on Ozempic. insulin. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, type twos on insulin, and it actually worked very well. All the um, sustained trials. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so I mean, that's, it. It obviously works. Yeah. Um, now it's type two. Obviously, a little different, but um, it, it worked, and it worked well, and they lost weight. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, you could definitely, that that was a little less blinded because you could definitely tell the patients that were on it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's in, I, like I said, I love that class of drugs. I'm super yeah. glad that we have an oral agent now in the yeah. market. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I've had so much success with that with my own patients, like starting somebody on a GLP 1 um, because patients will get referred to me when their A1C is like 13 or 14. Mm. And um, so I get all the, you're like, whoa. Yeah, I get all the ones that are just like the worst uh, <laughs> control patients. Um, but I, I mean, I've had patients that were, 13, 14, like that, they were on four injections a day because they were trying to do Novolog three times a day with their meals, Mm -hmm. trying to do their basal insulin, you know, sometimes one or twice a day. And then I switch it from, I just just completely discontinue their Novolog and start uh, either Ozempic or Trulicity. And Mm -hmm. like within, I've had some go from like A1Cs of 13s down to 7s and 8s within three months, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then from there I end up, because, you know, at that point it's, you know, it's probably even lower. I'm just waiting on the rest of those highs to fall off month by month um, for the average. And so I end up starting to decrease their basal insulin, you know, need as well. So I've, I've had so many people, in fact, one guy, I remember very vividly, he like, he fought me for it. I, I, I had the Trulicity City pen. I was showing him how to use it. I, I had to talk to this guy into like 30, 45 minutes. I mean, it was oh, ridiculous. Okay. And that's one of the benefits I have is where the, is the physicians have such a strict time frame they have to see that's one of the things that i really like about where i work because we have that collaborative practice where patients will get referred to me and i can spend as much time as i need to well, i mean within reason mm-hmm. but i spend much longer actually like either convincing or educating <laughs> or whatever the case may be where they just, they just wouldn't be able to from you know the, right. the, one of the other providers and so you know this guy was like absolutely not I'm not using this thing no way I finally talked him into it. I had to give use all my tricks to <laughs> talk him into it. And he he came back like two months later as A1C had dropped a ton. And he brought, I don't know why he brought it with him, but he had it with him, like his dose for that like week or whatever. He goes, this thing, he's a trulist, he's like waving at me. He goes, this thing is great. <laughs> he goes, I love this drug. And it was really funny because I was just like, you didn't have to bring it with you. You could have just, just, just told me. <laughs> but yeah. He did it for emphasis. Yeah, he did. He was waving at me and everything. It was great. Um, but yeah, he, he's, it was awesome. And I've seen so much, you know, benefit with that. Um, one of the, uh, I'll just throw this in there just for the listeners is like a kind of a clinical pearl. If, um, you are going to use a GLP one, um, at this point until we have other studies and things like that, I would definitely recommend either if you need it once daily, do Victoza because that has the cardiovascular benefit. It has, um, the A1C lowering the weight loss, all that, um, much better than like, um, Adlixin or Lixacinatide or Bieta, um, which is still available as well. Um, and then if you need it once weekly, I would definitely go with either Trulicity or Zempic. Um, both of those also have cardiovascular data. They have, um, they've been, Trulicity has been compared to, um, Victoza head to head and it met non-inferiority, which by Durian was not so lucky. Um, Tanzium also was not so lucky, which has been removed off the market anyway. And, um, Ozempic has been at least compared, the oral version has been compared to uh, Victoza. But um, those are the three injectables that I go with, Trulicity, Ozempic, and Victoza. I'm sure if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you've heard me ranting and raving about that. But not all uh, GLP-1s or any other drugs, for that matter, necessarily are created equal. And so <laughs> please do the nerd research and figure out which one is actually appropriate for your patients. And don't just take uh, people's word for it. <laughs> Anyways, that's my uh, soapbox for a second. <laughs> um, what else? What else you guys working on? Or anything cool you've seen? Or I'm trying to think, we uh, we have a lot of trials going on right now. Um, everything from like we went over Alzheimer's, um, the high cholesterol studies, type two is coming up. Um, we're gonna start working with like we said the GI. Uh, I think that's gastroparesis. Gastroparesis. Um, we're looking at and uh, I'm trying to remember the studies. The co- corset with the um, corset. We're looking at a um, Cushing's disease. Cushing, yeah. mm-hmm. similar to uh, Corlum. Mm. Um, I can't remember the medication. Uh, that one's such so specific. We haven't <laughs> had a lot it's of luck hard. with that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, to find Cushing's patients is hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the doctor that we, the PI we're working with on that one is actually like one of the foremost, um, experts, I guess, on Cushing's and, and Corset. Yeah. it's even That's hard awesome. for him to find, mm-hmm. um, people because it's very specific. 
the hot flashes. Oh yeah, we're working on a hot flash study um, with with Estellas. Estellas. Mm-hmm. Um, Vasomotor symptoms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's an interesting one because that uh, medication is a uh, fesalinitan. I think I said that. Hope I said that right. Um, and which is actually, I believe, being used for breast cancer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're looking at for breast cancer and now um, looking at uh, vasomotor symptoms in um, menopausal women. So that one's been interesting. We kind of dipping into a lot of specialties. Yeah. Um, What's your favorite like area that you've seen so far? Just like in your opinion, what, what oh. interests you the most? You got more experience. I'll let you into that. <laughs> <laughs> what interests me the most? That's interesting. Um, at first, and I, I probably say this the most is that, um, neurology probably interests mm-hmm. me the most. Uh, I started out, um, uh, actually in children's <laughs> neurology. Um, so we did a lot of absent seizures. Mm. Um, and it was when all of those drugs were trying to get approved for that, um, mm-hmm. migraines and that kind of thing. Um, the, we did the, um, a Pixaban trials, mm-hmm. which I, when I started here, obviously I started with internal medicine physicians, um, so I had no experience with those drugs, um, and to see them, um, work and work well, um, and know the only alternative other than it was pretty much Coumadin, mm-hmm. um, it was really cool to be on those trials yeah. and to learn about them, um, the 10 A's and the two A's. And then they're actually having a new one uh, coming out with 11 A, um, 11A or 9A? 11A. It's probably higher not, up. Uh, probably 9. It must be 9 because yeah. it's higher up um, on the on the food chain, as I say. That's um, cool. So I, I think those drugs were really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Especially now that the guidelines have all kind of – like the AFib guidelines have yeah. switched to using DOAX over warfarin in most patients yeah. for non-valvular AFib. Yeah. Um, the VTE guidelines for the most part for, you know, unless there's a specific indication um, where you couldn't use a DOAC – um, pushing that, you know, they're looking at an obese patients now. I mean, there's so much going on that I think it's such a better option. And my, crit- yeah. my critical care friends will disagree with me, but oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> just because the reversal agent's so expensive oh, yeah. and yeah. they had yeah. they, the critical care. And I actually, was, it was interesting because I, I did a paper, um, with uh, a couple of friends of mine that work out in Kansas and, and run the residency program out there for critical care management. And, um, I had never looked because from my, my patient population I deal with like in, in more internal medicine family medicine type stuff is we look at DOAX as like, you know, awesome. They're amazing. Like you decrease, especially with the Pixaban, decrease bleed mm-hmm. risk, um, you know, superior to warfarin, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in their population, those are the ones that are coming in with, uh, you know, a motor vehicle accident where they mm-hmm. come in and they're actively trying to stop bleeding yeah. and their, you know, hospital may not carry the new uh, DOAX reversal agent. <laughs> and so, you know, it's yeah. like for them, it, they're like, oh, geez. No. That's a good <laughs> yeah. point. That so, is a good and point. I had never yeah. thought about it like that. No, but I hadn't either. That was kind of interesting to get their perspective. So it was just like me and, and Cole, my co-host Cole versus them and like completely <laughs> two different sides of the, of the equation. Um, but that was a, a good one. Um, but yeah, th- I'm, I'm definitely curious to see how that evolves too. Yeah. What about you, Rich? What's, uh, what's your favorite like topic? What, what keeps you motivated to read? It's cause this is, uh, can be very boring sometimes. With some <laughs> of stuff. So what's your topic that like really gets you fired up? Um, I think neuro is interesting too. And having a little bit of experience in that kind of, uh, made it more uh, interesting for me um but also i think uh the high cholesterol and the cv risk is also really interesting in diabetes because you just see that so much especially um, in old south carolina yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. we like um, our fried food and our southern cooking <laughs> everybody's got diabetes yeah, that's true. Everybody. <laughs> yeah so that's um really interesting to see different um hopefully more efficacious uh therapies coming out for those patients and to um, help decrease the uh and I lost the word. Um, risk. Risk. Yeah. Risk, yeah, the, oh. um, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. very cool. So what's, what's kind of on the horizon for y'all? Do you, have you thought like, you know, 10 years down the road, do you guys have any plans like career wise? Do you want to keep doing research? You think do you want to go and do, you know, PhD? Do you want to just keep doing <laughs> like, have you just thought about that at all? Anything that I don't, um, I always have my 10 year plan. It always changes yeah, every year. <laughs> my changes every year too. <laughs> um, I don't even have a real 10 year plan to be totally honest. <laughs> Um, what I actually, I, I've, I've been at where we're at, uh, Palmetto primary care mm-hmm. nine years. Okay. Um, and so I had a five year plan and a 10 year plan when I started. Um, and both those got shot out the window. Um, but actually now in a good way though, eh. Ish? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> some of it, yes, it was definitely a learning curve, yeah. um, on both sides because I came and, um, you can 
do research in different ways. Mm-hmm. You can do it as a hobby or a business. Um, and I explain that to a lot of um, practitioners. Um, it, it depends on how you want to do it. If you're as a hobby, which is sort of how our doctor started out and sort of the way they were doing it, is you do a couple of studies a year, um, maybe five. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of small time, quote unquote. Um, and I was used to doing or having studies 20 at a time, mm-hmm. you know, 20 a year. So that was a learning curve on both sides, me sort of scaling back and them kind of scaling up. So we've, I think, gotten on the same page that way, um, which took about five years. And now we've, that second five years has been sort of making plans for the future. So we're, we've definitely done that. Um, I'm I'm probably staying where I'm at for the next 10 years um, because we're we're starting to open. Obviously, we've added specialties, um, mm-hmm. the OBGYN, the endocrinology, the GIs, um, uh, neurology, and then we're actually adding sites as well. So we're expanding to Columbia. Um, oh, nice. Planning mm-hmm. to, yeah, Merle's Inlet um, and hopefully taking over the world. There you go. <laughs> Very yeah. cool. As a, a little background for the listeners, um, PPCP has recently uh, expanded to Merle's Inlet in Columbia and hopefully... I don't know if I'm going to say this, but uh, Buford, they're trying to look down there. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're kind of eyeing some satellite sites because our office, technically our office's name is Palmetto Clinical Research. Mm -hmm. Um, And the two doctors that started it were Dr. Um, Grossman and Dr. Bolster. They're both internal med physicians. And um, once they joined with Palmetto Primary Care, we kind of became the research department. Um, So we've slowly... I mean, I'm the newest one there, but <laughs> from what I know of our history, um, we've slowly been, you know, increasing and hopefully hoping to grow and, and like Emily said, uh, get more studies, more specialties and things like that. We've, well, I mean, and we've grown since you've been there. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've added, yeah. what, all in, all the endocrinology mm-hmm. since you've been there. Mm-hmm. And I think so, and neurology. Dr. Carlisle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Very we're cool. expanding quickly. It, is, yeah. uh, is Matthews with you guys? Yes. yes. Okay. That's the mm-hmm. Cushing's. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Okay, Matthews. Cool. Yeah. yeah, we should have said it. It's Matthews wearing whole... And Bond, who just moved from MUSC over to the Carolina Endocrine. Um, Carlisle and Lucas are neuro- neurologists. And then we're working with um, Ronnie Givens, at a, a low country women specialist. Cool. Mm-hmm. You got to tell, if you see Dutton Matthews, tell him I want him on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he probably love yeah, it. Yeah, he probably love yeah. that, yeah. I haven't met him directly. I've heard a lot of good things yeah. about him. I haven't He's... actually had the pleasure of meeting him, but I'd love to get him on the podcast. Nice if you guys guy, can yeah. throw in yeah. a, uh, some two cents for me, that'd be, that'd be cool. <laughs> you could do a Christian's episode. There, yeah, 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 yeah. he, he talked nonstop. That'd be awesome. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't have to say that. a word. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, he... yeah. yeah, that'd be very cool. But um, what else? Anything else going on that you want to mention or... I know I've kept you on here for like an hour already. Oh, really? It <laughs> goes by oh, quick, God. right? It does. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, we are doing a Timulus study for osteoporosis with women. That's actually uh, Dr. Holes, the principal investigator on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really cool because the, you know now Timulus is injectable, and mm-hmm. they're testing testing a patch form mm-hmm. of it. Very cool. So, so that, that, that one's, one's open open label? Yeah, yeah. open label. So everyone's receiving medication. Mm-hmm. That one's Sweet. really good. Um, and half of them won't get, have to take a shot. So that's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the patch itself, um, is sort of microneedles. So the, uh, the medication's pre, um, yeah, yeah. not laced, <laughs> I don't know what laced, but it, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's in, it contained in the, in the uh, reservoir of everything. Mm-hmm. Right. the needles. Right. They were, they were talking, I think they came out with it. They were talking about even doing like a flu version of that where oh, they really? put it on. Yeah. And it gets released through these microneedles. Oh, I, I can't yeah. remember if it actually ever came to fruition, but I heard about that a couple years yeah, ago. I think so. Oh, that's an interesting delivery mechanism. Yeah. yeah. It's not supposed to hurt. That's what we've been yeah, told. Yeah, allegedly. And it's it's <laughs> yeah. only on for like five minutes as opposed yeah. to like a nicotine patch. A regular yeah, patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that's cool. That is cool. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come over on a Sunday afternoon and do this with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, get to nerd out a little bit. <laughs> But, um, yeah, and uh, we'll have to have you guys, you guys keep uh, getting new stuff in. Feel free to come on anytime you want. This is cool. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, Enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, and thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, um, make sure you send me an email. Um, you can also uh, use my new texting platform. Um, the number is area code 415-943-6116. Uh, you'll get an automated text back initially um, and asking you to you know join you know, my phone book and all that. And then if I have, uh, I'll send out exclusive information and stuff to my uh, people that follow me through text, um, and it'll come through. 
and anything else after that is actually me texting you back. If you ever have pharmacotherapy questions, feel free to send me a message over that. Um, you can also send me a DM on any of the social media platforms. Um, if you do like the podcast, please subscribe. Send us a nice comment. We like to read those. And if you ever uh, need anything, let us know. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you.